Hey, 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 how many of you are here Sunday night for Henry and Doris? I'm sorry. You can watch them online. It may not ever happen again. No, it's, I think it will happen again, hopefully better this time. Was I supposed to preach? Okay. Hey, one thing before, before I get into the message, uh, we have our camera set up out here. We've got our pictorial directory for all of our church. And if your picture is not in that, would you please stop by there today and get your picture taken for that? It's not a family portrait. You don't all have to be wearing the same thing. It's not professional like that. There are people who are professional photographers here taking pictures, but the idea is just to get your face in a book so that we can know each other. Okay, not just so the pastors can know you, so you can know each other. So um, if you're like my family, it's been like four or five years. My family has grown up and changed in five years. We need to get our picture taken today. So it'll take you a couple of minutes. If you're already pictured and you're just getting an update, just take your picture, sign your name so they can put that with it. But if you're new, fill that out, and uh, thank you for helping us out with that. All right, we are continuing a series that we have been doing for the last few weeks in the book of James. And I've heard some great things, response from people of the messages that we uh, have, have had here, and I hope that today will be more of the same. But today, uh, we're picking up in chapter three. Pastor Weaver talked about our tongue last week and the words that we speak, and uh, we're picking up the last half of chapter three, uh, where James talks about wisdom. And uh, before we get in there, you can turn to James chapter 3. We'll get there shortly, but I thought it would be nice to share a little bit of kid wisdom with you this morning. Since we're talking about wisdom, there's nothing like the wisdom of a first grader. A first grade teacher uh, collected some well-known proverbs, and she gave her class the first half of the proverb and asked them to fill in the rest. And here's what she came up with. You know some of these. It's always darkest before... Daylight savings time. <laughs> you can't teach a dog. No, you can't teach a dog new math. <laughs> Just like you can't teach a parent new math. Or parents can't help their kids with new math. An idle mind is. How come y'all are you're, you're not responding now? A, a, an idle mind is the best way to relax. <laughs> a penny saved is. No, a penny saved is not much. <laughs> here's, here's one that you know, I'm sure. Children should be seen and not heard. How many of you heard that as a child growing up? Nope. This child said children should be seen and not spanked or grounded. <laughs> no amens from that one, Okay. <laughs> As we talk about wisdom today, um, I, I think of all the knowledge that is abounding in our culture today and in our society, what we have at our disposal. We have more knowledge than at any time in history. And uh, the uh, former CEO of, of Google, Eric Schmidt, uh, left that post in 2011, but he, there's a statement that he made in 2010. And in 2010, the, the estimation was this, that every two days... We create as much information as we had created from the beginning of time till 2003. So from the dawn of creation until, or until 2003, we had X amount of information now every two days, and this has been nearly seven years ago, we're creating that much information in two days. There is a, a, a graphic up here that I want you to look at, and it's titled, Data Never Sleeps. And this is a graphic from 2014. You probably can't read this uh, too well, but I'll read a couple of things for you. Uh, 2014, which is now two, almost three years ago, but it, it's some statistics about data and information that's out there. What happens every minute through the internet? Every minute, Google receives four million search queries. This was in 2014. In 2012, that number was 2 million. So from 2012 to 2014, it doubled. Uh, I have no idea what it would be today, but 4 million search queries from Google every minute. Every minute, email users send 204 million emails. 204 million messages sent every minute. YouTube users upload 72 hours of new video every minute. So you take all the new videos that are being uploaded 
to YouTube every minute, 72 hours worth. Pandora listeners listen to 61,141 hours of music every minute. Amazon makes $83,000 of sales every minute online. There are some amazing statistics of what's going on and the information that's out there. Data never sleeps uh, since the internet. We have more information at our fingertips than we could possibly process. So our world is not lacking in knowledge or information or education. But listen, knowledge and information are not the same as wisdom. We have a lot of knowledge. We have a lot of information. But knowledge alone is not enough. How many of you know a lot of things? You guys are just afraid to raise your hand, but Pastor Weaver, he, I want to just share with you because there's so much information out there, and my eyes were just enlightened with some of the things that I learned about knowledge, and I'm going to increase your knowledge a little bit today. You know that the five most common stolen items from a drugstore, batteries, cosmetics, film, sunglasses, and preparation H. Five most common stolen things from a drugstore. How many of you, see, you'll remember this, right? Don't go steal Preparation H, please. I'll, Pastor Weaver will buy you some. We'll take a dollar blessing for you. Do you know that um, bees have five eyes? How many of you knew that? They have two in front and three on top of their head. I never knew that, but now you do. Did you know that a giraffe can clean its ear with its tongue? It's a true story. A giraffe's tongue is 20, from 20 to 22 inches long. So not only can he clean his ear, you imagine he can clean his nose too. How many of you knew that the human eye never grows? So from the time you're born, your eyeball stays the same. Yet your nose and your ear never stops growing throughout your life. Interesting fact. How many of you feel enlightened? Okay, I got more for you. Do you know that one person in every two billion on earth will live to the age 116? Two out of, one out of two billion. Let's see. The longest one syllable word in the English language is screeched. Who would have known that? Screeched. China has more English speakers than the United States. Did you know? Did you know that the shortest complete sentence in the English language is I am? Who is I am? God is I am. The shortest complete sentence in the English language. Did you know that Michael Phelps, if Michael Phelps were a country that he would rank 33rd out of the 205 countries that competed in the, in the Summer Olympic Games. He would be number 33 on the list of countries for gold medals, yes. He has more gold medals than the nation of Egypt. He has more gold medals than India. He has more gold medals than Argentina. He has more gold medals than the nation of Mexico combined over all their history. He's only one short of the country of Brazil. Brazil has one more gold medal than Michael Phelps. They have 200 million people living in their country. Interesting interesting thing, did you know? Did you know that if Barbie were life size, her measurements would be 39, 23, 33. She would stand seven feet, two inches tall, and she would have a neck twice the size, twice the length of a normal human being. Did you know that February 1865 is the only month in recorded history without a full moon? Did you know? February 1865, it's going to come up somewhere. You're going to remember that. Did you know that the name of all the continents on earth begin and end with the same letter? How many of you knew that? See, 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 it was worth you coming to church today. You're saying, you're counting, okay, America, Europe, it works. 
You know that typewriter is the longest word that can be made using the letters of only one row of the keyboard. Typewriter, the longest word that you can make. Did you know that rubber bands last longer in the refrigerator? Someone in the, someone in the early service said, yep, I know that. How many of you got rubber bands at home? Get one of those little baggies, put them in the, in the drawer with your crisper drawer, and you'll keep your rubber bands much longer. Did you know that there are 293 ways to make change for a dollar? 293 different combinations. Who would have known? Do you want more? <laughs> no. <laughs> we'll have a session later. This is all on the internet. You don't even have to look hard to find it. There's so much information out there. So now that you have an advanced store of knowledge in your brain, more than what you came with, uh, I want you to know this, that, that knowledge uh, is not wisdom. Wisdom is more than knowing a lot of useless information. You see, we have a tendency to equate knowledge or wisdom with intelligence or with degrees, but knowledge is simply the accumulation of facts. Wisdom is having moral insight with understanding and practical application. It's applying the knowledge, or it's applying the experience or the good judgment that we gain in life. Wisdom is measured not by the degrees we've acquired, but by the deeds we have accomplished. And again, we can learn a lot of, of wisdom from people who, don't, who, who haven't lived that long. Patrick, age 10. Now listen, we can learn wisdom from people who are, are really uneducated. Patrick, who's number, who is 10 years old, said, never trust a dog to watch your food. <laughs> How many of you know that's wisdom? Yeah. Michael, age 14, this is the wisdom he's given. When your dad is mad at you and asks, do I look stupid? <laughs> Don't answer him. <laughs> Randy, age 9, says, stay away from prunes. I wonder what life experience taught him that wisdom. Lauren, age nine, said felt markers are not good to use as lipstick. <laughs> Neither is fingernail polish. Joel, 10 years old, says don't pick on your sister when she's holding a baseball bat. <laughs> and Eileen, age eight, says never try to baptize a cat. <laughs> it's a lot of wisdom in what children say, a lot of wisdom right here. But we're looking for more wisdom than this. We've been working our way through the book of James the past few weeks, and uh, James has been making this point throughout the entire letter. He says this, our actions will ultimately tell the world if we are or we're not a true believer in Jesus Christ. It's our actions. It's a, it's a giveaway. And so as we look at this passage of Scripture in James chapter 3, he starts out with verse 13 with this statement. He says, if you, are under, uh, if you are wise and understand God's ways, prove it by living an honorable life, doing good works with the humility that comes from wisdom. So if you're wise and if you understand what God's, God's ways or God's will, then prove it by how you live. He's always saying there's got to be proof. Henry would say the proof is in the pudding. It's, it's just there. Everybody can see. It's, it's, it should be out there for everyone to see. Our lifestyle is the leading indicator of the level and source of our wisdom. It comes back to our life. In order for God's purpose to be worked out in our lives, we need wisdom. And so James says, at the beginning of the book, he said, if you, if you lack wisdom, ask for it. James chapter 1, verse 5, if any of you lack wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given you. So if you lack wisdom in your life, just simply ask, and God, he'll give it to you. No one wants to be seen as foolish or unwise. We want people to perceive us as intelligent, people who are in the know. And that's a good goal for us. It's actually a spiritual goal. Uh, Solomon, the writer of Proverbs, says in chapter 2, verse 1, Proverbs 2, verse 1, My child, listen to what I say and treasure my commands. Tune your ears to wisdom and concentrate on understanding. Cry out for insight and ask for understanding. Search for them as you would for silver. Seek them like hidden treasures. Then you will understand what it means to fear the Lord 
and you will gain knowledge of God, for the Lord grants wisdom. If we need wisdom, where do we go? God. Just ask. Seek for wisdom. You seek for wisdom like the greatest treasure that you can imagine. He also said in Proverbs 1 verse 7, fear of the Lord is the foundation of true knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. The psalmist writes in Psalm 111.10, fear of the Lord is the foundation of true wisdom. All who obey his commandments will grow in wisdom. Ask God for it, obey his commands, and guess what? Somehow we become wise. James is talking about different kinds of wisdom here, and we'll get into it in just a moment. But uh, General Omar Bradley from uh, World War II era said this, we live in a world, so this was, this was a statement back in the 1940s, we live in a world of nuclear giants and ethical infants, in a world that has achieved brilliance without wisdom, power without conscience, We have solved the mystery of the Adam and forgotten the lessons of the Sermon on the Mount. We know more about war than we know about peace. We know more about dying than we know about living. General Bradley realized and understood that there is a vast difference between wisdom and knowledge. Knowledge being the accumulation of facts. Wisdom, what do we do with what we know? So James chapter 3 If you're there, say, I'm there. If you're not there, you look on the screen and follow along. James chapter 3, he talks about two kinds of wisdom, starting in verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom, notice wisdom has quotes around it, such wisdom does not come from heaven, but it's earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. So the real question that we ask here is, how do we put this true wisdom into practice in our daily life? First of all, what kind of wisdom? James is making a uh, distinguishment between two different kinds of wisdom. A so-called wisdom that's from the earth, earthly wisdom, which actually comes from Satan, or the wisdom that comes from heaven, which is actually from God. So wisdom that, there's wisdom that comes from God, wisdom that comes from the world. How can you tell the difference? James is saying it's the fruit. You judge the difference by the fruit. How does it play out in a person's life? First, worldly wisdom, verse 15, he says, it's not God's kind of wisdom, but it's earthly. It's unspiritual. It's demonic. Earthly as opposed to heavenly wisdom. Its standards and sources and measures of success are in the worldly terms and has worldly type goals. Like I said, it comes from Satan. Verse 16, he says, this kind of wisdom produces trouble. It's all about self and survival. And it doesn't care who gets hurt in the process. And what it results in is confusion and disorder and evil of every kind. He's saying this kind of wisdom is worthless. It has zero value. So there's earthly wisdom, but then he talks about heavenly wisdom. Verse 17, the wisdom from above is first of all pure. It's also peace-loving, gentle at all times, willing to yield to others. It's full of mercy and the fruit of good deeds. It shows no favoritism and is always sincere. So I ask you a couple of questions here. Do you live your life with certainty? Do you live your day with certainty or with confusion? Are you sure of what is right and wrong? Instead of black and white, does everything seem gray? Maybe the line of distinction seems a little bit blurred. For some of you, there's a a constant question of how to live your life. Because nothing is consistent. Nothing feels right. Life is constantly changing and there are no absolutes to guide you. 
you ask this question, are there really such thing as absolutes? Is there truth that never changes? And the answer to that question is yes, absolutely. There are absolutes that are reliable, that never change. Truth that you can count on that stands the test of time, that stands the test of technology, that stands the test of trouble. It's truth that's true no matter what. You can find it in this book that is infallible, meaning there's no error in it. It has never been proven false, and it never will be proven false. Its author is God, the one who has all wisdom. Within this word, the Bible is everything that we need to know about God, about life, about eternity. This is our source of true wisdom. We can stand on the truth of God's word and know that it will never change because God never changes. The Bible says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. As you look at the world around you, things are changing all the time. You can go to sleep one night and wake up the next morning, turn on the news, and everything has changed. You never know what's going to happen when you turn on the news in the morning. We could turn on the news one day and find out that our dollar is worth nothing. How does that change how you live? I'm going to, I'm going to tell you, I'm not afraid. I know that somewhere in my lifetime things can absolutely change. I may wake up one day and my life is turned totally upside down. The world has gone crazy. I'm not scared. I'm not afraid. And no, I don't have a basement full of food. I don't even have water stored up. I probably should. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with a few days' supply of food, but I don't need 200 years of food in my basement uh, to make sure that I've got peace for tomorrow. There might be some wisdom in having some, something to fall back on, having some clean water to drink. But I'm not worried. Because while the world is changing around me, the God that I serve doesn't change at all. The promises that he's given us today when everything seems to be fairly okay, it's going to be the same tomorrow. God is either our provider or he's not. Do you trust God to take care of you in the good times and in the bad? Where do you get your wisdom James tells us that true wisdom is, first of all, pure. It's found in a pure life. True wisdom is pure, meaning it's free of defilement. It's without flaw. Even to the motives, it's pure. All of us know how to be on our best behavior. You remember being a kid, or children, teens that are here, you, you've heard this from parents. All right, we're going to go in these people's house, we're going to go in their home, and I want you to be on your best behavior. I want you to use your manners, please and thank you, all those things. We all know how to put on good behavior, right? We can hold it together for, for at least a little while, but that uh, be, altering our behavior for a particular situation isn't an accurate reflection of how we truly live. The real question is, how do we behave when we're all alone and nobody's around? Or how do we act when it's, we're just with some close friends? See, here's the thing. God doesn't want us just to act holy. He wants us to be holy. True wisdom is pure, and he wants us to be holy. It requires true repentance. It requires us following after God. Wisdom is being so clean that we have no ulterior motives. Purity is that we're the same all the way through. If you could cut me open and open me up, I, what I hope that you would see is that I'm the same inside that I am on the outside, that there's nothing hidden, there's nothing different. And the truth is, the Bible says that we will be known by our fruit, because whatever's on the inside comes out on the outside. Out of the abundance of the heart, Pastor, we were talking about the tongue last, last Sunday, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. It's hard for you to keep in what's really inside. But here's what, here's what he's saying. It needs to be pure. Seek a pure life. No ulterior, ulterior motives. The motive is what you see is what you get. It's the same through and through. Not only is true wisdom pure, it's peace-loving. It's characterized by, by the desire to get along with other people. True peace isn't possible until we first have peace with God. 
Romans chapter 5, verse 1, Paul says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have a peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 12, 18 says, Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. So once we have established peace with God, we need to pursue peace with one another. If we're going to experience peace, we have to pursue it. Peace just doesn't wander along and just find you accidentally. We have to be intentional. We have to avoid arguing. We have to refuse to participate in that stuff. You know, it's very difficult to have an argument when one person refuses to argue. Hard to have an argument by yourself. Let's just avoid arguing. How do we do that? We gotta trust God. Make peace your goal. James says, the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. If you find yourself always fighting with people, it should tell you that there's something that's not right in you. If you're angry, if you're hostile, I'm going to tell you, that's not inspired by God. Real wisdom is characterized by the desire to get along with others. So true wisdom is pure, it's peace-loving, and 30 says true wisdom is, is gentle. It's considerate of others. It extends to others the kind consideration that we would like to receive ourselves. It's the do unto others as you'd have them to do unto you. If you want people to be kind to you, be kind. Treat other people the way you want them to treat you. Selfishness makes us inconsiderate of others. James says selfish, selfishness is, is earthly wisdom. It's thinking about yourself only. James says heavenly wisdom is considerate. When we consider others, we're, we're looking outward, not inward. It's hard, to think, um, it's hard to think of others when we're only all the time thinking about ourselves. That's why it's important for us to, to not be selfish. One of the most effective ways to do this is, is to focus on other people. What are their needs and, and how can we help those people? The Bible says we're called, we're called to love one another. Romans chapter 12, verse 9 and 10. Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. That works great in a marriage relationship. That works great in a family. That works great in any relationship that you have. If we would take this goal of saying, I'm going to honor others. I'm going to think of them before I think about myself. I'm going to think about their good, and I'm going to care for them and find out what they need and take care of their needs before I meet my own needs. How in the world could we go wrong in our marriages if we had a husband and a wife and they were just honoring one another and they were outdoing each other in showing honor? It's not a marriage that's in trouble if that's the focus that we take. But that should be all of our relationships. We should be looking to other people. We should be honoring them. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others before yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests. Take an interest in others too. We have wisdom that is, that is pure, that's peace-loving, that's gentle, and that is willing to yield, that's submissive. It's open and teachable. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 15. Fools think that their own way is right, but the wise listen to others. Abraham Lincoln, to please a, a certain politician, issued a command to transfer certain regiments. And when the Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton, received the order, he refused to carry it out, saying the president was a fool. When Lincoln was told of this, he replied, if Stanton said I'm a fool, then I must be for he is nearly always right. I'll see for myself. And as the two men talked, the president quickly realized that his decision was a serious mistake, and without hesitation, he withdrew it. Are you teachable? Do you have a submissive spirit? Because those things are characteristic of true wisdom. True wisdom is full of mercy and good deeds. If we're full of something, whatever it might be, it really uh, it speaks to the fact that we're controlled by that. The Bible says don't be, don't be filled with wine. 
but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Basically, what are you going to be controlled with? What are you going to be controlled by? He's saying, be full of mercy. Be controlled by mercy. Luke 6, 36, Jesus said, be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Live a life of mercy. Be merciful to everyone. Not because they deserve it. I mean, there's some people that it's a whole lot easier to be merciful. Maybe they're a victim. We understand their, their situation, circumstance, something that they couldn't, they couldn't help. But what if they're guilty? We're still to be merciful. Think about the mercy that you received. I think of the story of the unmerciful servant who had, been, who had received the forgiveness of a, an incredible debt, a debt that he never could ever come up with to pay. And his master said, go, you're forgiven. And he went out and didn't have mercy on his friend. We've been forgiven a whole lot by God. And what does scripture say? That God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We're to be merciful even as he is merciful with us. We're to be full of mercy and good deeds or good fruit. Fruit reminds us that, that righteousness, is, righteousness is not produced by us, but rather it's produced in us. As believers, as followers of Jesus, his spirit is in us and it produces fruit. We'll be known by our fruit. True wisdom is a life controlled by mercy and good deeds. And last, true wisdom is sincere. It shows no favoritism or partiality. To be sincere is to be free from pretense or any deceit. It's not dishonest. It's not hypocritical. Not just to act as if we're not prejudiced, but we're to be sincere. It's not a pose. There's no deception, no mask wearing. Not a pretender. Someone who is honest. I want you to bow your heads with me, and I want us to be honest with ourselves. We sang a couple songs in our worship set this morning. One was, we started off by singing, do what you want to. And in the lyric of that song, it says, we surrender all to you. Lord, have your way in me. The only way that we're going to truly be happy, the only way that we're going to experience true wisdom is to live a life that's surrendered to him and to be honest. So I want to ask you with your heads bowed and your eyes closed this morning to be, to be sincere, to be honest with yourself, not pretending, no mask wearing, take off the mask and let's examine our lives and let's let the Holy Spirit speak to us. Let's examine the fruit of our lives. That tells the story today. We're not a judge of somebody else and what's going on in their lives, but we can see the fruit in their lives. But I'm asking you not to look at somebody else, not to look at the person sitting on either side of you this morning, but to let the Holy Spirit look into your heart and into your life and, and, and be honest with him and with yourself and answer the question, what is the fruit of my life? What does it demonstrate? Am I living my life according to the world's standard of wisdom? Or am I daring to look to God this morning and through every day of my life, I fix my eyes on Him and I listen to Him and I'm obedient to Him because wisdom comes when we're obedient to God's commands. And so I asked you this morning to listen to the Holy Spirit and respond. This morning, if you're not in a relationship with Jesus, if you're not following him with your life, if you've not invited him in to forgive you of your sins, it's the wisest decision that you can make. See, you're not here in this world for yourself. You've been created by God. He designed you with a purpose and he has a plan for your life. And that plan included Jesus coming and dying for you. We took communion earlier to remember what he did. And it's just a matter of you saying yes to Jesus. I accept your forgiveness because there's no way I can find forgiveness anywhere else. There's no amount of money on earth that I can pay to buy my way into heaven. The only way to heaven is Jesus. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And this morning I implore you, if you're not in a relationship with Jesus, say yes to him, invite him in. Ask him to forgive you. Or this morning if you're just saying, look, I, I'm, I, I'm guilty of looking at the world around me and kind of following the conventional wisdom. I'm doing everything that the world tells me I should do to be successful. 
you realize today the Holy Spirit is speaking to you saying, look, there is a different kind of wisdom. It's not the wisdom of this world. That's earthly wisdom, and it's actually demonic, and it comes from Satan. But honestly, this morning, you can say, I'm looking to Jesus. I'm looking to God. This is what he said in Isaiah. My ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are so much higher than your thoughts. As far as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways and my thoughts higher than yours. You better believe that God knows things that we don't know and has wisdom that's beyond our ability. The only way we can get that is to look to him. So this morning, the Holy Spirit speaking to you and I ask you to respond. that's you today and you need to give your life to Jesus or you've been following a different kind of wisdom and the Holy Spirit speaking to you today I encourage you and implore you to be obedient and say yes to him if that's you this morning and he's speaking to your heart and you're responding by saying yes to him would you just raise your hand all across the room you're saying there's a different way to live and I want to live the way God wants me to live And I pray for every person across this room who has a hand raised to you saying, I, I, choose, I choose you. I'm not going to live in fear. I'm not going to live in worry and doubt. I'm going to put my trust in the one who never changes. The world around me is changing. I don't even know if I can say this tomorrow and be okay. But God, you're the same. And we give our life to you. Give us wisdom true wisdom.